Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to talk about the anatomy and location of muscle spindles, and then we'll talk about their function in movement and exercise. But before we go into muscle spindles, I want to briefly review what we talked about in the previous video, which was the Golgi tendon organ. And what the Golgi tendon organs, which are located in the tendon sense, is the amount of force that's generated by muscles. Okay? So if there's only a little bit of force generated by this muscle, then the Golgi tendon organs are only going to fire a little bit. But if this muscle force is enormous, then these Golgi tendon organs are going to be firing at a really high rate. And so this is a way for the central nervous system to understand and detect the force generated by muscles at any given time all over the body. Another thing about Golgi tendon organs is that they function during exercise. So this skeletal muscle right here, suppose it was to generate a force so high that this tendon couldn't handle it. These tendons have a finite amount of strength to them. And so if the muscle generates a force that's ridiculously massive, it might actually tear this tendon right off the bone. And so you have a serious injury waiting for you there. And so rather than risk the injury, if this force generated by the muscle is high enough, and it has to be really high, the Golgi tendon organ will sense that, and through a polysynaptic reflex loop through the spinal cord, it will actually lead to the inhibition of this muscle. And that pretty much prevents you from generating that much force and potentially ripping the tendon off the bone. And we sort of see this when people go to the gym and lift weights. A great example is on the bench press. So you have a guy who's lifting, you know, a lot of weight, and he gets to his final rep, and he almost gets it up to the top, but his muscles start failing, and the barbell actually comes pretty quickly down to the chest. And the reason for that, that he's not able to get it all the way up to the top, it's not just fatigue. It's also that the Golgi tendon organs are saying, hey, if we actually generate more force to get this all the way up, that is the bar, we may actually tear this tendon, because the tendon won't be able to handle the amount of force required to get that bar up, accounting for the fatigue as well. And so, again, yes, there's fatigue, but getting that bar back down prevents potential injury to the tendons, okay? And sometimes you can have somebody with a pectoralis major there rip the tendon right off of their humerus. So that's not good. We're gonna talk now about muscle spindles, and rather than measuring force, muscle spindles measure the amount of stretch in the muscle. And they're also located in a different region. The Golgi tendon organ is, of course, located in the tendon of the muscle, whereas muscle spindles are located within the belly of the muscle, okay, the actual muscle itself. All right, so a few terms here. The actual muscle fibers that we normally think of as contracting that generate force that we go to work out at the gym, those are actually what we call extrafusal muscle fibers. However, embedded within the extrafusal muscle fibers, normally deep, we have the muscle spindle. And this whole region right here is the muscle spindle. And within the muscle spindle, we have intrafusal muscle fibers. Okay? So these intrafusal muscle fibers are going to be surrounded by the sensory nerve endings which comprise the muscle spindle. And these sensory nerve endings are going to sense the degree of stretch of the muscle. So for a minute, if you think about, let's say, your biceps brachii, if you put your arm with the elbow in the completely extended position. So your arm is completely lengthened by your side. Your biceps brachii are going to be in the lengthened state. Okay? Now with muscles, they are extensible and they are elastic, meaning they can stretch and then recoil back. But like a rubber band, if we stretch that rubber band too far, what happens? It breaks. And the same thing's true of a muscle. Yes, they're extensible, but we don't want to extend them or stretch them too far because that can cause injury, obviously, to the muscle itself. And so these muscle spindles play a role in sensing that stretch and then preventing uh, that muscle from stretching too far. So these sensory nerve endings are going to send their axons up to the central nervous system, first to the spinal cord, and then to the brain. And that way the brain is going to be able to monitor the length of the muscle at any given time, monitor the stretch. And in that way it acts as a proprioceptive organ, and it helps us monitor our position of our limbs in space. So whether or not you have your elbow extended at 180 degrees or flexed to 90 degrees, 
Part of the way that your brain senses that, other than looking at your arm, is by measuring the length of those muscle spindles. Okay. All right, now let's take a look at the muscle spindle reflex arc. All right. Now, notice that this axon right here from the muscle spindles is only going to the spinal cord right here. The reflex arc only involves the spinal cord. However, there are axons that project upward to the brain, um, and that helps our brain understand the relative positions of our limbs, the angle of our joints, the relative length of muscles, and so on and so forth. Okay? But for the reflex arc, it only involves the spinal cord. It doesn't need to go up further. So right here, here's our muscle. This is our agonist that's being stretched. Down here would be the antagonist. Okay? So for example, this could be our biceps. Down here would be our triceps. So let's suppose we stretch the biceps. Right? So we have our muscle spindle here. The muscle spindles are also stretched, and they sense that, and they fire action potentials along this axon of this sensory neuron that goes ultimately into the spinal cord. Right? We'll zoom in a little bit here. Now this blue neuron, which represents the axons from the muscle spindle, notice that it does one of two things. It either synapses directly with this motor neuron right here in pink, it kind of goes along here and then leads back to the agonist muscle. Okay? This pink neuron is an excitatory neuron, meaning that it stimulates this muscle to contract. And let's think about why we would want that. If we have a muscle that's lengthened too much, all right, we would actually want to contract that muscle because contraction, by definition, shortens the muscle. And so to prevent so much stretch that it might rip the muscle, like a rubber band, we stimulate this muscle to contract, in which case it shortens. And so again, notice that this blue neuron is going to synapse directly with this pink neuron, which is excitatory, and that stimulates the agonist to contract. All right, again, lengthened muscle. We don't want it lengthened too much, so we'll contract it to shorten it. All right. But also notice there's another feature to muscle spindles. This same neuron that detected the stretch in the agonist is also going to facilitate the antagonist to relax. All right? So we see this neuron again in the spinal cord going this way is actually going to synapse with an interneuron. Okay? This interneuron will then uh, inhibit this purple motor neuron. This purple motor neuron is going down to the antagonist muscle, which in our example was the triceps, and it stimulates the triceps to relax, or at least and it causes the triceps to relax. Um, the major thing though we want to focus on is really the fact that stretch of the agonist causes a feedback loop which stimulates the agonist, that same muscle, to contract. Because if the muscle's too lengthened and it continues to stretch, that could cause injury. So we want to cause it to contract to potentially shorten it. Right? Now there's a direct application of this in what's called the patellar knee-jerk reflex. So whenever a physician actually takes this little hammer right here and hits it right below your kneecap, what they're actually hitting is something called the patellar ligament. All right? And so when they tap this patellar ligament, it actually artificially stretches the quadricep. Artificially stretches the quadricep. Okay? Just a little bit. But it's enough stretch that these muscle spindles within the quadricep can sense that stretch. And so if the quadricep is stretched, that will stimulate the quadriceps to contract. And when quadriceps contract, we get knee extension, right? And that's what happens reflexively when they tap your knee. And so if we follow the same logic up here at top, when these muscle spindles are stimulated, that there's stretch in the muscle, that is artificial stretch by hitting the ligament, they fire action potentials along this axon, which go into the spinal cord, and they synapse first here with this excitatory pink neuron, which then feeds back to the quadriceps and excite them to contract. And that's why your quadriceps contract. But we also want the antagonist to relax. So in addition, these muscle spindles also, in the spinal cord, snaps with an interneuron here, and that interneuron leads to the activation of this neuron, which is inhibitory. Okay, so this actually leads to the relaxation of the hamstrings, relaxation of the antagonist. All right, and so again, contraction of the quadricep to prevent too much stretch. So that's our patellar knee jerk reflex. All right, 
Now, if you were doing bicep curls, let's go back to that example of the bicep. When you bring the bar up, obviously your bicep is shortening, and when you let the bar back down, your bicep is lengthening. Now, obviously we don't have that inhibition of the lengthening or the stretching of the bicep as you bring the barbell down. So there are voluntary mechanisms within the brain to override this, okay? But this does become uh, functional when you're either fatigued on your last repetition or when there's significant danger of tearing the muscle. But even so, when there's significant danger of muscle tears, you still can override this and it can still lead to disaster. Okay? I'll give you a great example, which I'll show here in a minute. This guy I'm gonna show you is gonna do a deadlift and he's gonna use um, opposite grips. So one of his hands is gonna have an overhand grip, the other hand will have an underhand grip. If you kinda do that with yourself, if you look at the underhand grip, um, you'll notice that there's actually gonna be a greater degree of stretch in the bicep of the arm that has the underhand grip. And so when he goes and does the deadlift, he has a significant stretch of that bicep, and so much so that it tears the bicep. And you say, well, wasn't there this reflex arc to stop that? Well, considering that he was doing a maximal effort and he probably wasn't that fatigued, his central nervous system was able to override this mechanism. And again, it still led to the stretch of that muscle and eventual tear. Again, with muscle spindles, their major job is to monitor the stretch of skeletal muscles. And this provides two things. One, when we're just moving around and so forth, it allows our brain to monitor where our limbs are in space by determining what angle our joint's at through how long or stretched the muscle is. But then also when we're doing exercise, it helps to prevent injury because if we stretch the muscle too much, then we can tear the muscle. And so we're gonna have that involuntary reflexive contraction to help shorten the muscle and prevent it from lengthening so much. All right, so hopefully this made sense. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you very much.